oh, I realized I was not recording. <laughs> I'm just gonna pause and say, welcome again to Designing for Impact. I was not recording our introduction. This is Brittany with Base Day Health, and we are very excited to offer this series of capacity building webinars, workshops to you all. Um, before we get started, just some tips on virtual engagement. Um, add your name to the video. Um, we would love to see faces with the, with the correct name there. Sometimes a phone number pops up, but we would just like to know who you are. Um, throughout the presentation, please mute your microphones. Uh, use the chat feature to ask some questions. And um, the presentation is being recorded. Uh, we just want to tell folks, you know, if you do not feel comfortable potentially having your face captured um, on the recording, just feel free to shut your video off. We, we respect folks' decisions. Um, the chat will be live for folks to see, but we recognize that sometimes face people don't like to show their face and that's totally okay. Um, and just so everyone knows, after our presentation today, the slide deck will be shared as well as the recording. So again, welcome. We are very excited to have, we have about 60 plus folks in the room with us, which is phenomenal. Um, and I would like to now welcome Kathleen Zegda from the Public Health Institute, who will be presenting um, the content for this workshop entitled Designing a Program for Impact. Thank you, Brittany. So i um, very excited to be here and I'm looking forward to um, talking through some of the, um, the contents for this um, for this program we have. First, I just want to, to um, just recognize, we have called this a workshop series um, for the purposes of today. And I think for the others as well, we have about an hour and we have uh, many people who are joining. So we'll be going through some different materials and some different concepts, um, but it, it'll be more um, I'll speak to some different concepts. We'll ask you guys to share some um, for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A, I think. Right, Brittany? Is that... Yes. Okay, great. So, so for today, um, I'll, um, I just want to share. Uh, so I'm with the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts, and um, I oversee our research and evaluation program. I'm um, the Director of Community Research and Evaluation. And for today, I'm gonna speak about some different um, concepts related to designing a program for impact. And it's based on my experience in doing evaluation and research, but also um, previously I was um, worked with the Pioneer Valley Asthma Coalition and I oversaw that program and was involved with program development. And also I was a program officer at CDC and I oversaw um, state program funding in the Office of Public Health Genomics. So just drawing on different experiences um, over time in these different roles I've had. So for today, um, we're gonna be focused on um, talking about program um, planning and design and solidifying your program idea, understanding steps to develop the program, and then also thinking about how to maximize impact by incorporating PSE change into planning if possible. Um, I've uh, had the fortune to work um, over time since I moved into this region with some um, amazing partners and programs in both my work with the Asthma Coalition and then also in the evaluation work I'm involved with. And I'm gonna incorporate some of those examples into to what I'm sharing today. So, First, um, just hoping to get a sense if people have a topic that they're working on. And so can people share a sentence in the chat if you have a specific topic? I know some of you are, um, maybe not everyone, are put in an LOI for the Better Together grant program. And so just to get a sense of the different focus areas in the room and who has an idea they're thinking of, or some of you may just be here to learn a little more. So I'll give a, um, a minute. If people could just put that into the chat, that would be great. Awesome. I'll read out some things that we're seeing here as we go along. So it's like there's some folks um, who are creating a steering committee on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so topics of children and youth group support and education, food access, um, equitable access to healthcare for youth and LGBTQ youth of color, using remote, technology for health monitoring, social emotional peer supports for veterans, health education, 
medically tailored meals and nutrition, youth mentorship. They're amazing products. Uh, yeah, so sounds like a wide range of projects and definitely people are thinking about a lot of different things and um, a lot of thinking about equity, thinking both about um, some of the more um, social determinants of health and then some more directly health related. So great. So, um, so first I'm going to talk a little bit about program design and I do also just want to acknowledge I, I know some of the folks who are in the room and I know some people are already doing some of these things and we have a wide range of experience and expertise and even similar with the policy systems of environmental um, work as well. So my hope is to speak to, I'm going to speak more broadly and hope that um, some of the examples and some of that we, we talked through um, will help. The, the range of people, but if people have specific questions again or comments, please put them in the chat and, and Brittany will raise them as we go. And then we'll have time in the end to discuss more. So if people could just put in the chat um, three, three words, what do you typically think about when you're designing a program? Nothing yet. Oh, there we go. Feasibility, budget, and need. Goals, timeline, community need, capacity, partners, impact, outcome, and sustainability, reach, viability, evidence, cost again. Mm. Yeah. So it sounds like people are already thinking about a lot of the important things we need to think about when we're doing program design. And so I'm going to speak here and sorry, I'm trying to juggle through. I haven't done this where I try to look at the chat as well and then trying to look at the slides. So please be patient as I do this. So, um, so I'm going to talk through some of the things um, to think about when you're thinking about program design and planning. And that will be the first part. And then again, we'll move into policy systems and environment. And so I'm going to use this. Um, this framework and so commonly use framework by adding in just some additional steps and it may not exactly go in this order, um, but um, these are many of the things to think about as you're designing and so I'm going to use an example from my work with the Pioneer Valley Asthma Coalition as we go through this as a way to think about um, some of these things. So first, as we talk about assessing needs so understanding what the needs are of the population that we're trying to serve. And it may be a program within your, like it may be um, a population within your organization or more a broader community population or um, just thinking about that. So um, in, the, in my case, so this was, um, was a while ago and when I first moved here um, from Atlanta and was working with the Asthma Coalition. And we knew and saw there are high rates of asthma here in the region and that there, um, a contributor to this was um, home environmental triggers. And so um, one of the things that we were seeing, so when, as we assess the needs, so among people, we had a number of different partners within healthcare, within um, housing, within a variety, and this work continues on today. So it's exciting to see how it's evolved, um, but we definitely saw a need for that um, education around environmental triggers, helping to address them, um, and then also um, both also managing asthma. So that was in our case, when looking at all of the data, so existing data and understanding um, and the programs available, which was important as well, then that was what was identified as the need. So that may be looking at existing data you have in your program, um, the community health needs assessments that uh, have been completed um, for the hospitals. We um, worked with a consultant team to for the Bay State hospitals and others in the Coalition of Western Mass. That's a source of data. But there's another webinar that will be coming where people, um, there'll be a discussion about data that will be taking place. Um, is that the one on Wednesday, Brittany? This Thursday. This Thursday. So once you've identified needs, um, thinking about then very specifically the problem to address. And so again, in this case, seeing the needs related to asthma and the home environment and management, um, that was what we were going to focus on and target for 
for our particular um, our particular program. And when thinking about this, um, it's really important. And so when for folks who are applying, um, you'll see when in the application process, we ask people to think about a logic model and the problem or the goal and the problem that you're trying to address to really think through and try to be um, specific about in like thinking about the population and some of the like who is your target um, that you're trying to focus on and things along those lines. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk through the program design. And then the next step is thinking about um, identifying resources. So resources meaning both within your organization and in the community as a whole. And so um, some of these things, there's um, a workshop that's been done on grant making that Kimothy Jones has been doing as part of Bay State. And she has people walk through what some of the things that they're looking at as they're designed their program. And some of the questions that are included in this is, um, does your organization have the expertise and capacity or infrastructure to undertake um, what you're thinking about for um, addressing the problem? Or what do you have that could, um, that could be um, utilized to address the problem? Uh, is there internal staff and, and board support as part of the resources that you have existing? External and community support, are there community partners as well? Um, what orga other organizations are doing this work? Um, are there, when, in part of this, it's looking and almost doing um, as well an environmental scan as part of assessing this. Are there other people who are doing this work and there seems to be duplication of efforts? So really trying to understand within the community, within the organization, what um, what are the existing resources and then how can your program or organization address the need here and identify potential areas for collaboration as part of that. So then as, and looking at this, and again, it doesn't necessarily go in this order, really thinking through goals as well. So let me just back up. In our case, um, looking at existing resources, we were working with um, healthcare providers and so we're thinking about, okay, there, is there a potential? We know people need help within the homes. Um, is there a possibility then working with the healthcare providers and some of our local housing agencies to have a home visit, like a home visiting program? So really thinking about who was at the table, what resources were available, and then what type of um, you know, grant resources out there we might apply for to get the program up and running as part of this. Then the next step is thinking about setting the goals for the program and thinking about what specifically are we going to um, focus on to address for the purposes of this. And so in our case, um, and it's, it's part of, so once identifying the problem, identifying what you're striving to do as part of your program. And so we were thinking in our case that we would like to establish, as I mentioned, this home visiting program um, to reduce asthma um, exacerbations and asthma um, morbidity as a whole. And so we set um, this goal of seeing if we could establish a program. And simultaneously, in addition, thinking about um, are, what else is going on in the community. So just to mention and thinking through this, for example, are there other programs that may align? So at the same time, we knew the schools were working on trying to address environmental factors. So that became a, the part of the partnership in this. So in terms of thinking through um, what the resources are and the goals and how to align them. So a big part of the next step is understanding what are existing programs that have um, taken place that have shown to be effective. And so an important part of this is researching the evidence base. And again, Margo is going to speak to this. And um, in the, um, the um, RFP, there's discussion about evidence-informed programs. And so part of this may be looking to see, are there best practice programs out there? Are there programs that are um, in the literature as effective programs or promising programs, there's also different sites that people can go to where they've been reviewed as well. And so in our case, there was some existing programs that have been 
had taken place that um, for home visiting and community health workers. And so after researching several different models, picking um, a set of practices that were, um, that were shown to be effective in the grants that, um, that had taken place, but that made sense in our community. And that's always a really important part of this is what, how um, the programs actually will translate to the communities that you're serving. And then another important thing is when you're looking at evidence-based um, research and, and programs that exist, considering which of these projects most align or most compatible with your organization's mission and purpose as a whole. And so the next step is to move from there to designing the program. And so based on what you've identified, what feels like it would work. And um, as part of this, it's really important to think through who's going to be involved in your design and decision making and which key stakeholders are going to be involved in as a part. So for us in thinking about it, um, and similar to when we talk to people about evaluation, the people who might be involved with implementing the program, it's important to have them involved in thinking through and troubleshooting. Um, people who you would want to have some higher level buy-in as well. And thinking about also as part of this um, cost, some of you had mentioned cost and feasibility. And so what's feasible to be implemented and um, also thinking from a grantsmanship perspective, what's unique about your organization's project because you wanna make the case why this would be, um, why you should be funded. So that's another consideration as well. And then an important one, if you're doing an evidence, I mean, in general, but especially drawing off of an evidence-based program is what do you need to be able to implement with fidelity? And some of the people may, um, may ask specifically how you would do that in your, your grant application. But um, a lot of the programs have been um, examined and there are certain elements that are are important for them to maintain their evidence-based um, fidelity. So how are you going to be doing that? So for example, if you are going to be doing an education program, um, how are you going to make sure that you're covering those key concepts that are part of that, um, what's been shown to be effective and that people um, are doing so in, in the um, teaching it in the way that's been demonstrated to be effective. So for example, some um, interactive elements are a critical part of programs and how are you making sure that you're doing those and incorporating the, the, um, the key elements as part of that. And I'm gonna talk a little more. Um, and if there are other things that people are thinking about in terms of designing the program, but I'll speak a little more about things to think through, please throw them in the chat. Um, would love to hear other ideas people have in terms of thinking through designing the program. And just quick check. Um, and so then the next step being implementing the program. And again, this is um, important to think about from both um, a perspective of making sure that you have, um, you can implement with fidelity, and then that you can implement in general, um, as you've intended. And it's really important, I didn't put in here, but a lot of the models have is this piece where it's ongoing data and feedback to think about, um, to understand, are you implementing your program as intended? And so, we have separate trainings where we have um, arrows and it's an iterative process with data and it we don't have that here. There was a model that I was examining, but with um, all of these steps don't have that piece. Um, but it's really important and it's to be expected that there's gonna be some challenges initially. And then, um, so using that data, understand what's working, what's not, how can it be approved, improved and, thinking through as well this the piece around evaluation 
Um, and so collecting the data that you need, and that is all part of the program design as well, is thinking about how to collect the data that you need to be able to ensure that you can assess your implementation and your process, but then also the outcomes as well. And it's an iterative process um, because then as, as discussed, it means tweaking and improving the program as you proceed. So some of the um, specifics to think through, and especially as you're thinking through feasibility, cost, um, thinking about program um, participants. So depending on if you have um, participants who are already that you're seeing as part of your organization, if it's a larger um, community initiative where you're recruiting, or if it's community-wide change, what are some of the recruitment procedures you have? What are some of the inclusion exclusion criteria? Who are the subgroups that um, need a, alternate attention or perhaps thinking from an equity perspective um, might need additional um, resources and or um, program activities? Um, how will you be contacting participants? Thinking about the settings, so number and frequency of the sessions, is the setting appropriate for activities you're planning? Um, so who, where um, the target for your program as well, like target, target setting. Um, length and duration of your program is important as well. Total time required for duration of the program and for all of its sub elements. Thinking about staffing, again, this is important part of cost and all of these these um, factors feed into a cost as well. And so thinking through um, what is the staffing needing to carry out your program? Um, and also thinking through theory of the program. So um, just to pause and talk more about theory. So if when people are filling out the, um, if you're applying for the grant, but I'm sure people have applied for other grants, there's logic models you've had to fill out. And so, Logic models will show, and that's going to be coming up in another session. Um, I, I do believe that one's on Wednesday. And so as part of the application process, um, showing how you're planning to get from your set of activities to your intended outcomes. And it really helps to think things through. And it's really valuable from a program design perspective, but also an evaluation perspective. And so um, when you're doing that, some of that may be um, based in a theory of change model. So how, why, why do you anticipate that your activities will have the outcomes that you do? Um, but it may not always. And so for example, um, one theory of change is if you're trying to have behavior change is the stages of change model. And so um, it's a specific framework where people are moved from, or um, thinking about people who are pre-contemplative to um, so not even thinking about making a change if you're trying to. Um, so for example, in our case, people, and that was one of the frameworks we used for the, um, the grant that we did for the home visiting. Um, so people trying to make a change in their homes to, to, um, so that they wouldn't be having some of the asthma environmental triggers to um, contemplative, which is where people are um, actively aware and thinking about making change to action. Um, and so this is a theory of change. And so in looking at what, how you're thinking about making change, it's helpful to think through your theory. And so this may be part of what you're doing in your logic model, but it may not be. So this is something you may research as well and, and speak to in your activities. And then the um, modality or activity, like when you're doing activities, thinking about translating theory into practice. And so that's really getting into the nuts and bolts of what are your, what is your curriculum and details. I know in some of the evaluation, so we provide evaluation technical assistance to the grantees under um, the Better Together program and also Health New England. And that um, is really important. And we, we've talk through some of the things um, in thinking about the curricula and evaluation and um, what you're trying to achieve through this. And so it's a really important consideration as you're designing your program and thinking about your resources as well. So I just wanna take a pause and see if there are any questions or comments that have arisen, Brittany, um, as we've talked through this first piece.
again, it's very high level and I, I, I recognize that. And many of you may already, um, it sounds like people are already doing a lot of these things. I think just given um, timing for today, just wanted to touch on these various aspects and then we're gonna move into policy systems and environmental change. No questions as of yet, Kathleen, but I will continue to keep my eye out. Okay, great. Thank you, Brittany. Okay, so next we're going to move into policy systems and environmental change. And before we jump into this piece, um, I want to do a quick poll. Let's see how this works. Brittany and I were setting this up right before to get a sense of people's experience doing what we call PSE, policy systems and environmental change. And so if people could just respond to this poll, have you worked on policy systems and environmental change initiatives before? And the responses are, I have done a lot of PSE work. Uh, next response, I've done a little, or I don't know what you're talking about. So if people could just take a second to respond to that. I see a lot of folks have answered, a couple more to go. All right, responses have slowed down. So I'm just going to end the poll and share results with folks. So if you can see that on your screen, it looks like about seven responses around having done a lot of PSE work, 31, uh, so about half of you all um, done a little work and about a third of folks saying, I don't know what you're talking about. So perfect okay. segue, Kathleen, into your the PSE. Yeah, thank you, Brittany. And thank you everyone for sharing. So for those of you who have done some policy systems and environmental work, and I will say PSE, but I'm aware that we're gonna talk about what that means. If people could just take a sentence or two and put it in the chat so we can see some examples, that would be great. And as people are doing that, I'm gonna speak a little bit to what we mean by policy systems and environmental change. And so um, policy change includes policies and it, it could be at the legislative or organizational level. And it's um, a written statement. And um, so it could include laws, it can include legislation, um, it can include local municipal res uh, resolutions, and it can include things that are both big P, so that's the state legislation, or little p, and that might be more local policy or organization policy or school policy. So for example, um, a couple, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work that um, some of my colleagues have done that we had the fortune to be involved with as um, evaluation partners, which was Live Well Springsfield Transforming Community Initiatives work. And we do have some of those partners here today and some amazing work that's done to make policy systems and environmental change focused on childhood obesity and Tobacco 21 in the Springfield area. And so um, an example of a policy that was done was advocacy to um, pass the Tobacco 21 policy. So um, the, you could not purchase tobacco products um, the, under the age of 21. So that would be an example. So moving on to systems. So systems are um, change, changes in organizational procedures, for example, such as personnel, resource allocation or program and systems change um, can involve rules or changes in rules made to the organization, um, but it could be, for example, um, a system to ensure that equity is incorporated into an organizational activities, or it could be um, a system to like, for example, a programmatic system to identify and refer, refer people who are food insecure in their program activities. So it can be a variety of different things. Um, and then environment is, um, and again, definitions can vary depending on where you look, but broadly, um, physical or observable changes in the built economic and or social environment. So the environment we are in, but thinking more broadly than just the physical environment. Often people will have heard of, and if you look at the Department of Public Health's guidance around um, health um, programs that um, should be funded as part of some of the um, DON or um, programs like the Better Together program. Um, they talk about 
the built environment. So um, the environment that we um, is built around us and it can impact our ability to be active, um, physically active or our access to food as well. Um, or the social environment, which really can impact social isolation and other things. So, um, so that is what we mean when we speak to environment. Brittany, did some examples come up? Yes, um, we have some folks here talking about um, drug and misuse prevention at a community level, um, mass in motion efforts around food deserts, mm -hmm. um, inclusivity and power shifting in decision making and governance. Um, everything from legal reform to gun violence, um, Springfield Food Policy Council. Uh, we did have a question come up, Kathleen, that I'll just throw out and maybe you can answer it here later in the presentation. And it's around how do we evaluate the settings of projects with the current pandemic? So I'm just going to throw it out now. Maybe that's something we you want to discuss later. But um, if folks want to respond to that question, even in the chat, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, so I'm not entirely certain they said the the settings of programs, I think there's a broader question about how do you evaluate effectiveness of programs given the pandemic. Um, I think maybe can we just hold on that for right now, Brittany, and I'll speak Perfect. to that during the, the question and answer section. Perfect. Okay, great. I think it's an excellent question. And it's something we talk about a lot too, and our ability to do that right now. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna continue with the policy systems environment and sorry, this is a little fuzzy, but um, I just wanted to share the social socio-ecological model. And so, um, and people who have seen like um, the uh, determinants of health model and seen things where they're framed, there's the individual level um, where it's about an individual's knowledge, attitudes and skills. In this case for the socio-ecological model, um, interpersonal, so families, friends, and social networks, and then organization. So again, these things are within these larger spheres, um, organization, organizations and social institutions we are part of, the communities, these organizations are in communities um, and there, it includes the structures and with the communities, but then also relationships between the organizations and also public policy at the national, state, local laws. And so, um, in thinking about policy systems and environment um, and overlaying some of those concepts on here by imp impacting some of the policies or systems or environment, whether it be at the organizational community or national level, we are impacting um, many people um, on, at the individual level as well. So just thinking about how these things fit. And, those who have seen the term as a health, it's similar in terms of thinking about more broadly as well. And so um, in thinking about addressing health inequities, which are differences in health status um, across populations that are systemic, avoidable, unfair and unjust, and thinking about this policy and systems environment, um, this is a model or a framework um, uh, that um, I think helps us to think about that a little more. And it was done by the Bay Area Regional Health and Equities Initiative. And so when we think about the more traditional focus on addressing um, and improving health, and even I know the funding through the Bay State Health DON is focused on determinants of health. Um, it's been more traditionally focused on downstream and focused on individual level and um, specific health conditions here. And really when we're talking about policy and systems, starting to look at and think about, and I don't know if people can see the, my arrow on the screen or not. Yes, um, we can. Okay, great, thanks, Brittany. Um, we'll see, we see that moving more upstream, we see the um, societal and social inequities that people experience based on class, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, immigration status, disability status, and there are many others. Um, we see institutional inequities as well. And then um, this con these things contribute and to each other, but then also to the environment. And so this is what I was speaking to, um, like looking at the physical environment, the social environment, the service environment, and economic and work environment. And so by impacting um, these environments, 
um, policies and systems at institutional societal level um, really potential to impact many people. And so um, this is a quote by Dr. Frank Robinson that I've always appreciated and learned early on in, in working with him, you get what you design for. And so I've always appreciated that in thinking through the design. When you consider your policy and systems environmental change, it can really maximize the impact of your work. And it's really important to consider in the design phase. So when you're thinking about that planning and design I was talking about, and it could be that it's the focus of what you're striving to do. So it's really about, I'm going to intentionally change um, this organizational policy or little p or city policy, tobacco 21 to improve health, or it could be a part of your work overall. And an example of that, when I say that, it means that your work may be focused more on programmatic change, but you'd really like to um, see that lead to more of a system change within the city. So an example would be, um, for example, uh, in that Transforming Communities Initiative um, project we were involved with, one of our partners, um, Square One, was working on having um, changing their own environment and incorporating curricula related to physical activity and healthy eating. But then we're, we're taking the learnings of their pilot and advocating um, for systems change amongst early education and care providers in the city overall. Um, so really, if you're thinking about that, or we, for example, in some of the healthy eating and physical activity work we um, were working with our other, the other partners we're working on, um, focusing on a pilot school with the intention to use the information and data to advocate for um, district-wide change. So really thinking from the beginning about what your goals are and if you're trying to have a larger impact and have more systemic change as part of that. So a framework that we used um, for that project and so for the TCI, Transforming Communities Initiative. So this is called the REAIM framework and it's used for um, evaluation and thinking through programs, but more specifically um, for thinking through policy systems and environmental change. And I um, and we found it really helpful to use this framework. And so I've included a couple of references here um, and people have talked about how it can be specifically used for policy and systems and environmental change. So the components of this in, involve thinking through, um, and some people had said this in their program design reach. So really thinking through who am I trying to reach and how many people will be affected? And so it's a little different when you're thinking about a policy system or environmental change. And so if it's, for example, you're going for um, a citywide um, change and adoption of the Tobacco 21, for example, which was successfully adopted at the state, but the city adopted it as well, um, how many young people would potentially be impacted and thinking through that as part of it? or um, for example, if it is focused on a school, how many students um, your, your um, work to make change within that school and then potentially for the district as a whole if you're planning on doing that. Next step of your policy systems environment and some of these are going align and as they should with thinking through and, and what I was talking about for that program planning. So effectiveness. And so that's thinking through what is your research. Um, so what is the um, what is out there in terms of effectiveness as you're researching the different policy system or environmental change? So is there evidence of effectiveness? Does it make sense that it would work here? Um, and so that would be thinking through um, the next piece of this. Then. In terms of thinking through, so if you're looking at trying to have um, a policy or a systems change or environmental change, um, the next piece is adoption. So how many people or how many organizations or cities or whatever you're looking for have adopted? So that would be understanding the efficacy of what you're striving to do. And so um, it could be the number and percent of settings that adopt this, the intervention policy systems or environmental change. Um, 
And there are other measures in terms of thinking through adoption. It could be thinking through, like if it's in the case of some of the work, we were looking at a school wellness policy. So um, it was adopted, revisions were adopted, um, some fantastic work from those partners in the Transforming Communities Initiative. And so um, looking at it was approved and therefore adopted at a system-wide level. And then implementation. So this is a piece um, we all strive for adoption and a lot of funding is about making these changes. But a really important part of this that doesn't always happen is really focusing on the implementation part of a policy system or environmental change. So we, this policy has been adopted. It's great that everyone's supposed to be doing this. So for example, let's say that Tobacco 21 policy, are people actually following the policy? And when you're thinking about this, it can be when you're talking about who's following it, it's both the implementing organization or body or whatever that may be, but also the people impacted. So when you're thinking through what you're striving to do or what your actions might be under this type of framework, um, if the Tobacco 21 policy being adopted in Springfield is, is it being consistently adhered to by um, the uh, the stores who sell tobacco products, and then also is is it being um, adhered to by the people who live there and would be buying the products? So there are important things to think about because they would be different actions to think about when you're planning the implementation phase. And then maintenance is the long term sustainability um, component of this, and so again. It's important to think about both implementing this and um, at the organization, so thinking about that, or even, for example, um, the wellness policy that there was some great work going on and that was adopted. Um, it's a lot, it's wonderful, and it's the first step to have people say, we're going to do this, and then it's the next step to make sure it happens, and then the next step is to make sure it happens sustainably over time. And that's where evaluation and data is really key to understand each of those pieces um, about it being implemented and then sustaining over time. And so this is a framework that can be helpful in both planning your program, your program, uh, your initiative activities, and then also for evaluation as well to understand because all of these pieces are really important to, to see the success you're striving for. And especially, um, I can't, I mean, say the number of conversations where um, people have been so excited about the adoption and then the implementation was where there just wasn't the funding and there wasn't um, the follow-up, um, there just wasn't the resources with the follow-up and then either unclear if it had the impact or understanding that it wasn't happening. So just a really important piece. Um, just a couple more minutes and then we'll take some questions. So. A really important piece to, um, to think about when you're thinking about policy, policy systems and environmental change is engagement of stakeholders in this and thinking about adopting these, um, these changes. So stakeholder engagement is, is critical to obtaining buy-in for policy systems and environmental change and important to think about explicitly as an activity as part of this. And so, um, for example, in thinking about um, the, the, um, the program activity that was taking place about um, the healthy eating and the curriculum in, in the preschool, and then the um, trying to get larger systems change in early education and care, really thinking through who's it important to engage, to have them understand um, so that um, we can more broadly have this adopted or even the wellness policy, for example. Um, there was some amazing work and very intentional work to reach out and engage um, school committee members and um, local um, city council as part of that work. And so figuring out who is it important to at least understand what we're trying to do and be educated on it? And then who do we actually need to involve in our efforts to make this change happen and want their buy-in to be advocates as well? And so very intentional activities and um, we're really instrumental in the success of, of some of these projects I've been describing. 
And so I just wanted to share this as well. So this is um, a range of stakeholder engagement. And so it's based on the International Association for Public Participation's model for engaging um, engagement and the Department of Public Health's model as part of this work. And so really thinking uh, in this framework, um, informing, which I had just said, consulting all the way through to more engagement to um, community driven or led as partners in this process. And where are you targeting um, your engagement activities so that you're able to have the buy-in and the advocacy and um, understanding of people to be successful in what you're trying to do. And there's some examples that they have for this as well as part of this. So in summary, um, program design is important to increase the likelihood of having your intended impact and policy systems and environmental change um, can really um, increase the impact quite a bit in thinking this through and have greater impact and are really important for driving change. Stakeholder engagement is really critical in, in this work. And I spoke specifically to policy systems and environment, but it's very important in the program design overall in thinking through who do, um, um, who understands best, like what we're trying to do and also then who do we need the buy-in from to make this happen and you get what you design for. So the intentional like thinking about all of these different pieces as you design your program, knowing that it's not gonna happen right. I mean, there's so many times where I've been involved and needed to make numerous changes and that's where evaluation is important to have the data to know when you do, um, to be able to think about doing that. So, so now just wanted to see, um, turn it over for questions and uh, if people could put it in the chat. And see if we have any questions or comments even. Maybe uh, Kathleen, we can start circling back to a question submitted by Nairobi around um, current pandemic and how we do evaluation or you talk about evaluation of the program um, design and impact, but she also specifically referenced um, the setting of your project. So Nairobi, if you're still with us, not sure if you want to clarify a little bit more of what um, you're defining setting as, if it's... Sure, I was just, you know, wondering about, you know, access and, you know, how um, to think about a project that the people are going to be going into a particular space. And so that's along the lines that I'm thinking about, like the setting. How do we, you know, think about that and evaluate that based on this current pandemic and the limitations on um, the current um, health guidelines? That's, um, and I think also, Kathleen, you mentioned the great point on evaluating the actual project um, during this current pandemic and measuring that piece. So I think both um, is a part of the question. So. Yeah, so I think um, there you raise um, some excellent points in terms of thinking about um, the setting and what's going to be most effective given our current um, environment we're living in and the challenges that everyone is facing. And then also understanding if what we're doing is, is working. And so um, I think it's really hard. So going to the evaluation piece, um, like understanding what the it maybe you're not seeing the outcomes as a result of what's happening with the pandemic or because something is, is not um, just related to how you're implementing your program. And I think it all goes hand in hand, um, understanding and hearing from people given, I mean, I can just speak from some of the things that we talk about um, and understanding from people um, the challenges that people are facing as you're trying to implement your program and some of the alternatives that people can, um, can use, internal alternative methods for engagement. So it's a big challenge, equity as well. And um, so I think hearing from people and understanding and thinking then um, thinking about how your programs and in what settings they can be administered um, Again, just it's, it needs to be driven by what, um, how people can be engaged and 
um, really about information and gathering as part of this process. So, and then teasing out the differences are really hard um, about what the challenges in evaluating the program and understanding um, what would be, what is you are seeing or may not be seeing as a result of um, how your program is being implemented and the outcomes um, or what your, uh, the pandemic, the result of the pandemic as well. Um, I know for us, we have um, a study we have going on to look at the impact of a, a complete streets policy. And in part of that is looking for um, at activity amongst people. And we know that people aren't having normal activity levels right now. It's just very different and it, it is very challenging. And I don't have a good answer for that, to be honest. And I think um, right now we're all just struggling with trying to figure out the best ways to understand um, what's working and, and what's not. And um, a really big part of that, I think, is, is hearing from people and being creative. Awesome. Another question that came up here, Kathleen, that maybe I feel like I can start addressing and then maybe you can add on to um, was systems and environmental change work is often uh, long term and requires significant resources. How much of this can Bay State expect to happen given the relatively small resources that are available? So I think this is uh, related to the, the dollar amount of funding that you know we have allocated for each of our four hospitals for those who are applying to our Better Together RFP. Um, I would say P uh, PSC projects are not an expectation, um, like a direct explicit uh, expectation from uh, this current grant process. Um, the reason why we wanted to have a session on a PSC a change is because we know that this, first of all, this term has been thrown around a lot lately. Um, and as many of you may or may not know, the Department of Public Health recently had kind of a statewide request for proposals that sought um, uh, initiatives that really focus on policy systems and environmental change. So because that is a um, a move that we feel like our state is going towards, that DPH is going towards, and our Bay State Health funding for this um, RFP does uh, really align with DPH, and we consult with DPH constantly on kind of um, the angle we should take. You know, the specifying uh, social determinant of focus this year was something new for Bay State and a recommendation from DPH, actually a requirement that each hospital region would have to pick one social determinant to really focus on. So because there's kind of this momentum, we really wanted to provide this opportunity to just really define for everyone what we mean by PSC. And if you can integrate, as Kathleen said, it may not be the sole focus of your proposal, but if you're like, hey, I think I can incorporate some elements um, of PSC impact into my project development, um, we're, we're welcoming that and we please invite you to do that because we know um, that the impact really is long-term as you've stated here. Anything else, Kathleen, related to systems and environmental change work being like a heavy lift, it seems like significant resources are needed. Um, is the perception maybe that's, that's going around? Um, so I would say that um, it, it, it can be, but not necessarily even just to try and like the example I gave about um, trying to uh, think about how the, um, what's learned, for example, if you're doing your own pilot or program and it's effective with others to get buy-in and more systematic change. Um, I think it's it can absolutely be a heavy lift. And I actually, uh, there's a couple of folks here, I know who are on the call, if they still are, who are involved with some of the systems and environmental change. Um, I would invite them to speak to that as well. Um, if they're still on the call, um, B or Catherine about it being a heavy lift in your thoughts. Not to put you on the spot, if you're willing. Hi, this is B Dewberry from uh, Wayfinders, and um, we um, managed uh, two actually policy system environmental change grants. Um, we were a collaborative partner with the Transforming Communities Initiative, uh, funded by Trinity Health Systems, and we're a past Bay State Health Better Together grant recipient with our Healthy Hill Initiative work. And um, I, I think if you keep the PSC lens 
as part of your work when you're designing and then even as you're you know building programs and um, building um, policies and activities it's helpful i don't i didn't find it to be a heavy lift at all i think it it helps keep you focused on outcome like what you're really seeking to achieve at the end of the road so to speak and um to a large degree that actually helps you infuse some sustainability elements into it. If you're always thinking about, okay, where do we want to be? We want to go from point A and get to Z. Um, if you're thinking policy and system and environmental change, then you're automatically working toward uh, impact versus, you know, by removing that you can, it's easy to get lost. So I didn't consider it a, a heavy lift at all. I think Kat responded in the chat as well. Yeah, so Catherine had said that uh, she her sound's not working, but she she agrees it can be a heavy lift, but you never know, um, as exemplified by the surprising success of the Tobacco 21 work, work by MLK Family Services. So um, young people were doing some um, organizing and advocacy around this, and it was it was um, passed, and it was pretty amazing. Awesome. So we want to, we know there's one minute left. Um, Kathleen, if you could quickly present the last slide that oh. we have on evaluation, just so. Yep, um, hold on one second. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, as many of you all know, this is a series of webinars that we're hosting. So we won't be doing a specific evaluation after each uh, webinar, but at the end of this series, we'll just send one evaluation form where you can identify which sessions you were a part of. So we just wanted to tell folks, please keep that on your radar that Monday afternoon of the 9th, we will be sending out this evaluation form just to get your feedback. Um, and to see who was here just as a learner and who was here maybe as an applicant, we would love to just get that full range of feedback. So thank you for joining us. Um, we hope you have a lovely afternoon and hopefully we'll see you at the next one. And thank you Kathleen so much uh, for lending your time to this uh, workshop. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>